I'm Brooke Sproul, and my lovely guest today is Foa Kinfire, an old friend of mine, a dear friend of mine, and a very powerful somatic practitioner, educator, and healer. She's also a musician and performance artist and a dream worker. And uh, I'm really excited to see what emerges today. Welcome. Thanks. Thanks, Brett. Thanks for having me. Hmm. So where shall we begin? What have you been pondering lately? Well, I'm, I'm currently like in, a, in the suburbs, which isn't a place that I feel comfortable in. <laughs> um, so that's on my mind and just feeling the, the control, the, the clear control and the simulation of the suburbs and how the design is for safety. Um, that they actually make me feel less safe. So that's sort of like the first thing that I'm, you know, that genuinely is sort of living on the surface of my experience. I've been visiting the suburbs as well and having similar experiences. I remember a month or so ago I was down there and I, and of course this isn't entirely true. This is an oversimplification or overgeneralization, but the feeling I had was I can just, you know, fit myself into what I think I'm supposed to be, then mm-hmm. I can maybe put off the task uh, permanently or temporarily of deep self-examination. So I don't know if that's true. That might be a, a complete projection, but that was the feeling that I had um, along with a feeling of just a, a, a lack of cultural value for individuality and individual expression. Like mm-hmm. a feeling like because since we both grew up there, feeling like I have to show up a certain way to be accepted as opposed to I'm celebrated in my uniqueness. Mm, Interesting. Yeah, it's interesting to think about design and how it impacts our personalities, worldview. Um, Yeah, because I I imagine that avoiding looking at what's difficult exists in other you know, in other scapes and other sort of like city designs. But there is something about um, the suburbs that it feels, it feels denuded. It feels like the wild doesn't really exist there on purpose. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, And I, I, you know, again, yeah, we're speaking in generalizations, but I also feel like there is something about individualism of like, this is my property, like this is mine, you know? So there's maybe individuality of ownership, um, but there is like this sort of falling in line with um, presentation Mm. that does feel like a pattern um, and sort of formulaic. Um, It is interesting, we both grew up in that context how do you why we became friends <laughs> outsiders <laughs> outsiders in the... i know but it wasn't for like emo music in the in the early 2000s Water over saved our lives. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it really was helpful <laughs> just like everything sucks and is painful you know it was like i needed everything to counterweight everything i was seeing around me where everything was fine yeah. right right, right. Fine, exactly. <laughs> yeah and i i agree with what you said about of course in every human we all in some ways aren't looking we all in some ways are avoiding it's not to it's not to make a statement that that's not present in me even right now in real time there are of course ways in which we all don't look but there's something i had this feeling about a more systematic or a more Mm -hmm. um robust feeling about that like um and, and not not like that that it's conscious um but just like oh there's that that feels like the culture there and then mm-hmm. what you said about, you know, the individualism versus individuality, perhaps, is one way of framing it. Um, mm-hmm. What I've been thinking a lot about lately is how, like, each, there's all these different movements, you know, socially, culturally, um, politically. And there's a reason that they, that many movements, you know, even where we might look and say, oh, that's, that's not 
the most um, constructive movement. There's a reason that they resonate with a lot of people. And it's because in my, from my perspective, there's some truth and some real deep value that that movement is speaking to mm -hmm. people. But the reason that in, in my view, they might be not, not be constructive is because they leave out the other side of the conversation. So when I was thinking about what you were saying about individualism versus individuality, I was thinking, oh, there's this really strong individualism and it's not balanced with collectivism, you know, like mm, it, it feels like right. it's, it's, it's individualism and then it's conformity. Mm. It's not like individuality and collective integration. Like there's, mm -hmm. there's some perversion of what I think is an optimal kind of way of structuring a culture, which is we, we kind of celebrate each individual's attributes while um, kind of collaborating, collect, you know, as a collective mm -hmm. and finding a place for each person in reciprocal service. Yeah. And it's not to say that there aren't other places. I mean, I think in, I think in every culture, I'm sure there's ways that things can be recalibrated to be more optimal. Like maybe there are certain cultures that are so collectivist that the individuality gets denigrated in some ways mm -hmm. that are hurtful, of course, that exists as well. So there are all sorts of ways in which, you know, we can, I think that not only we can, but we have the responsibility to be looking at where these, where that balance is and how to recalibrate and create a more optimal way of relating. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. For some reason, as you're speaking, I was reminded of um, the cul-de-sac. Maybe it's because you live, you grew up on a cul-de-sac and like the design and function of the cul-de-sac was like this filtration system mm. to keep you know, the riffraff out or to see who's in your neighborhood. Mm. There's a book about, I'm forgetting the name of the author called The Wages of Whiteness and, and white supremacy in, in suburban design specifically. And that the cul-de-sac sort of functions as keeping people that symbolize poverty sort of out, slows them down. You kind of get a chance to see them, you know, get a take on them. And, um, and then on top of that, again, specifically referencing the bioregion bio region in which we grew up, grew up in, I'm thinking about how many neighborhoods were actually built on marshland and how that is actually the ecological filtration system that like helps to purify the rainwater that goes out to sea. And so there's this sort of like simulation of filtration that's based off of ideas and ide ideologies. And then there's the erasure of the actual filtration system that supports, you know, aquifers and marsh territories and, and ocean territories and I don't know why that's coming to mind as I was listening to you. I think it just sort of like drew me into like an ecological perspective on what's happening in, in, in the where we called home. I'd also love to talk about some of the things we've been communicating about lately separately um, because I think something I'm feeling really in touch with right now is my own wounding. So often I'm speaking to the uh, capacity that we all have to transcend our ordinary limitations and, you know, uh, live our greatest potentialities and make an impact on the world and, and achieve kind of awakened states of consciousness. And, you know, all of that is true and I believe it. And I think that I also want to just be really mindful of speaking to how our wounding is a part of, of what opens up our highest potential. It's anything, any way in which we engage with our, you know, limitations is ultimately kind of a part of the process that allows us to become the greatest version of who we are. And so I'm feeling kind of in touch with my wounding right now um, and my, uh, my limitations, my struggles, and kind of, you know, was thinking about potentially exploring some of the conversations we've been having around 
codependency, um, boundaries, communication, um, you know, would you be interested in exploring that? I've been dealing, as you know, with chronic pain and being uh, medically disabled since I was 12. And I've tried a lot of different things to try to make that pain go away and make myself different. And a part of it is natural, you know, to, it's natural for us to not want to feel pain. And what I've found recently that just feels so deeply aligned with um, what it means to be present to my wounding is to just allow, like just allow the pain feel, and it's a somatic technique as well, to feel the, to feel all the nuance of all the pain, to go right into it and track everything as if I'm a witness to something that's happening. Um, and in that there's a sort of resourcing that is established that allows me to validate what's going on um, and validate that it's my experience and then also invoke um, sort of third party in my consciousness that um, is sort of an observer in the room. Mm. And it takes away my propensity to coerce in a race. Um, and the way that my nervous system responds to that is radical. It's radical because the nervous system feels heard. Um, the nervous system doesn't feel corrected. So that's something that comes up for me in response to the, the topic of, of witnessing and feeling wounding. Um, codependency and boundaries, they're sacred coping, <laughs> you know, devices, mechanisms that uh, most of us have learned are useful or were useful. And as we get older, we can see how they are no longer useful um, and don't necessarily create the safety that we're looking for, which kind of leads me into the notion of safety at all and how sa safety is, it's a valuable simulation. It's important. It's not like, you know, I also think it doesn't exist ultimately, but it's important to create. So it's almost like it's almost like boundaries and codependency are sort of the guides. They're the sort of harbingers into the deeper wound. They kind of let us know. Um, they're the protectors, right? And something that I've been noticing is how little they actually protect me and how they they actually sort of estrange me from my nature and from um, what it is that I long to do and how it is that I long to live. And like, that's okay. Like they're here, like come in, you know, come in to the circle and let me learn about you. Those are, yeah, those are notions that come up for me around all those things in response to your invitation. Yeah, the thread between the two from where I was, what I was feeling and, and, and pondering was this, uh, this idea of being in conversation with our parts, you know, uh, with our nervous system, with our codependency, with our wounds, with our boundaries, like that these are all parts of us that, you know, and, and as you beautifully said about the nervous system, um, you know, when my nervous system is heard, it can relax and release, you know, mm -hmm. it can, it can sort of self liberate self heal. Um, and there's something in that process that is healing on a more psycho spiritual level, because um, we are getting out of the dynamic of coercion and erasure. Right. And, you know, so much of us are so much of our culture is coercive, and we internalize that and we have these warlike coercive relationships with ourselves. Mm -hmm. And it's really in the surrender to our own involuntary pain that 
there's such a great deal of spiritual and psychological liberation and healing that occurs. And so I love how you talked about kind of, oh, here's, here are these things, like say with codependency, that in, in my words would be, you know, defense mechanisms, protective mechanisms. But it's like, yeah, well, welcome, because I need protection. Like, mm-hmm. like we, we need protection and, and mm-hmm. we don't know ways to assertively protect ourselves. Well, that's fine. Here we are, you know, in this pattern that might be backfiring. And as we become more aware of that, we can start to relate in more empowered ways. We can gain skills. But the beauty of just welcoming in and listening to our parts is so Mm -hmm. healing and transformative. And there's a lot of research actually to back this up. Internal family systems therapy is a modality that's really about, you know, naming our parts, getting to know them, listening, helping them feel heard and understood. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of evidence that uh, supports its efficacy and trauma healing, as well as even physical health conditions. Um, it's, it's quite remarkable, the reverberating effects that mm. um, it has on our system to welcome and integrate and listen to all of our parts. Mm. And the, the seminal book in, in IFS is called No Bad Parts. And so the premise is, mm. you know, even the things that we think are, you know, the worst parts of us, the most damaging, destructive defenses, they all serve a purpose. They all have a positive in, intent. They may not have positive consequences. <laughs> they may have, you know, harmful things, but they have a positive intent. And when they're listened to, they can kind of relax and serve the purpose and, and, actualize that positive intention. It makes me think so much of the punitive justice system as opposed to restorative justice. Um, I've been fantasizing, kind of going back to like design of systems, like the suburbs. I've been thinking about prison systems and prison reform. And I, and I have very little education beyond being exposed to the current political justice system because of my family, my parents' occupations of choice. Um, What would it be like to have this sort of language and template laid over folks who are struggling with addiction or folks who are violent Um, and tracking the nuance of their stories, of their origin stories, of the families and neighborhoods in which they grew up. And instead of approaching things with punishment, approaching things from a regenerative, restorative model that allows for their complexity to be explored and uh, provides resource in response to the complexities that are discovered about that particular person's biography and biology. It just doesn't make, for example, like addicts, it makes no sense to me with someone who is trying to take care of themselves and self-soothe through whatever substance they're drawn to are sent to prison. It's like, I mean, I understand that there's nuance. I understand that like maybe they're being violent or they're breaking other laws or violating people's safety and boundaries um, in order to acquire that you know, attempt to medicate themselves. But I think that um, there's just room, there's room for this IFS model um, in the justice system. And I'm sure it's a harrowing road and there's a lot to do and a lot to implement in order for it to be applied and applicable. But yeah, what if we started looking at things from that perspective as if someone isn't doing something wrong or we aren't doing something wrong. We're just trying to take care of ourselves. Well, yes. And if we really understand human behavior from a systems perspective, which is (laughs) what is true, you know, like we individually, in a way, we individually don't commit crimes. Like I know, for example, that if I were in certain circumstances, I am confident that I would have made very different choices, Mm -hmm. but to presume that I am somehow morally superior Mm -hmm. is is I think the error, uh, you know, that a lot of people make is, you know, that I, I made these choices, uh, you know, as an individual sort of decontextualized and it's really unfair because it's like put in the right circumstances or the wrong circumstances. I think we're all capable of, of nearly anything, Mm -hmm. you know? I was just going to say that 
I mean, in response to what you're saying, there's two things that come up for me. One is that the empire makes money off of people being incarcerated, you know, and that that leads me to wanting to throw into the pot that there's something about the loss of indigenosity that's in the mix as to why we as a species are dealing with so much depression, um, struggles with regulating our nervous systems, addiction, violence. I mean, all of these sort of like less savory aspects of the human experience are, they're a part of the human experience, I think, regardless. Um, and I think that the sheer magnitude of the presence of those different qualities and coping behaviors I feel like really confident and I, I don't know if there's any studies, but just through my own observation and work on grieving the loss of my indigenosity as a white person, um, I just feel how it goes back to that, you know, of this like separation from place and how the a place and land in a bioregion influences my sense of belonging to community my sense of participation in community, what clothing I wear, you know, it's like the fibers aren't from the land upon which I lived or died with the plants from that territory. You know, there's, there's sort of this dilution of meaning that is connected with that, that intersection of empire and loss of indigenosity um, that we're kind of indirectly referencing in my opinion when we talk about any of the things we're talking about yeah. and which brings a really important question into the foreground which I think is paramount to moving forward as a people is like what does it mean to restore indigenosity when we don't live in the place that our ancestors originated from what does it mean to create meaning, connection with the human and the non-human and the place where in which we live. Um, yeah, it's a big one. Yeah, one of the most kind of helpful concepts for me as I've been trying to reclaim a non-dogmatic spiritual awareness is around my relationship to nature and the framing of individual or person and nature as opposed to individual or person as nature um, mm -hmm. you know like like that I'm actually not separate from the land I'm actually I'm actually not mm -hmm. separate from nature um, we're actually counterparts and we are we are interdependent and yet not only our thinking has taught us to be separate but our um, you know, our, our development, our, our kind of like design, like our urban design, like the way that we've designed things mm -hmm. has furthered this concept and instantiated it um, in the way that we live. Yeah, yeah, totally. I think that's one of the reasons why I feel weird in the suburbs. It's like, I don't, I don't feel that, um, it's difficult to feel that, to feel nature. But it makes me think about, are you, have you familiar with um, that author and thinker? I think his name is David Abrams. He wrote um, Becoming Animal, I think is the name of his book. Oh, well, really he, yeah, he has this really interesting um, lecture series he was doing in Amsterdam that I nerded out on several years ago. That's definitely informed my work as a dream worker specifically, but certainly also somatic work which is why I call my business movement ecology. Um, it sort of plays off this idea you're talking about of the body as nature. Um, but he talks about how like you could go into the like 20th floor of a high rise building and open the fridge and find like some forgotten Tupperware leftover that's covered in mold and how like the wild is everywhere. Like there's no escape, no matter how, like we're all gonna die, which is an example of wild nature. Like there is no escape. Mm -hmm. We can try to convince ourselves otherwise with our gadgets and our cul-de-sacs and our, you know, fluorescent lighting or whatever, but 
it's here and and similarly like that's something that i talk about with dream work is for some of us it's kind of our only access to like the wilderness because dreams are feral they do not obey um, our code of ethics our sense of morality um, they live in the realm of taboo of violence sometimes of of terror and unspeakable beauty um, so yeah i i totally agree with you and there's something really really deeply deeply important about recognizing that we are we are wild nature and what is it what does it feel like to rewild ourselves and I think that going back to parts work, it's sort of like allowing all the all the inputs in the ecosystem of our being to be witnessed and present mm. and tracked and noticed because they're there, even if we don't want them to be there, you know, it's like. So tell me about how you work with dreams. Well, the lineage that I that I have been studying. Um, with my mentor, Matt Cochran, for, I've been studying with him for over 10 years. It's actually called dream tracking, which is a term that he coined that um, likens dream work to tracking an animal in the wilderness, finding their tracks in the forest floor. And in approaching dreams that way, they become sort of a dynamic territory that we get to return to again and again and learn and understand. And it becomes a relationship that grows and responds as we continue to respond to them. Um, yeah, so that's sort of like the premise of the work is, is acknowledging that there is no patent way of um, interpreting dreams. I don't, I don't actually feel comfortable with the word interpretation. I feel better with tracking or relating to dreams. Um, it really helps to sort of know a little bit more about the backstory of what's really, what's a person, what is whatever person I'm working with, what is their experience of their life up to this point and what is most pressing in their life in, in that particular moment. And with those two understandings, listening to their dream. And there's different tools. There's somatic tools of like understanding, you know, how someone feels in their body when they remember the dream or actually speaking about the dream in present tense. So we're actually like returning into the territory of the dream. I find it be really helpful. It's difficult. It's, it's difficult to remember to do that. I, I still struggle with it, um, but it's really useful way of allowing our sort of cognition to take a step aside and not in, and not um, analyze the dream with our waking mind, but actually be in the dream and remember how it felt. So we can we can really gather the authenticity of what the dream is trying to offer. How is dream work used in service of maybe some kind of transformation or change? Like what's the mm -hmm. purpose of dream work and, and how do you see it relating to um, people's goals or, you know, mm -hmm. um, capacity to, uh, to change or, or transform in some way? Mm -hmm. I find dreams to be really pragmatic. Um, even if the language is outrageous or outlandish dreams really show us what we need to look at what's that mary oliver poem about nightmares the nightmare comes and tells you that you need to know this it's um it's an honest it's the i feel like dreams are perhaps one of the most honest voices that we have and that goes back to their wildness. So in terms of like relating that to personal transformation, um, it's sort of a sacred catalog of what needs to be known either for us or for someone else. Like we can have dreams for other people. We can have dreams for the land. Like 
it's yeah, it's difficult for me to answer that question because it feels like it's so much more of an organic process. It's diff difficult to quantify. Um, and like being with our dream self restores an aspect of our humanity that who knows where it will lead us. I mean, for me personally, as you know, I've recently decided to move to Oaxaca, Mexico. And I made that decision based off of a dream that I had. And I, that I've had, I had like six or seven years ago that I've been holding and not trying to turn it into something right away. So my mentor always kind of like <laughs> saw me about that because one of the things that he says is how can you let the dream live? That's like a precept of, the, of this dream tracking work. Um, and sometimes I really like to literalize it right away the dreams, dreams tell us what we need to know. And it might be something that's going to be useful like many years from now in terms of like what is wanting to be transformed. Or it could be something that needs to be turned towards the following day, you know. Um, but it's really how dreams participate in someone's transformation is as infinite as there are people and experiences. Um, which is some, it's like, it reminds me of the planet, you know, it's, it's, they're so complex. It's, it's difficult to know how they will. In, in. Yeah. Yeah. What came up for me when you were talking was, you know, this feeling that in a way you, that our dreams can be like prayers or, um, or little messages from our higher self or our future self or something mm -hmm. that's being born inside of us saying, you know, over here, <laughs> pay attention, you know, just yeah. kind of beckoning or inviting us uh, to look, to pay attention, to, to, to see. Um, yeah. And just from a kind of psychological lens, you know, what you were saying made me think that really our dreams in some ways are about, integrating our shadow and mm -hmm. um and our unconscious uh and so much of you know what i believe is transformative is our ability to integrate the disowned parts the parts mm -hmm. that we think are bad you know back to our ifs conversation right mm -hmm. um to integrate the parts that we don't see and to bring them into some kind of consciousness so that you know not to control or coerce them but to to be in relationship to them as you say yeah, and then I, I also am thinking about like shamanic journeying, altered states of consciousness, and this mm -hmm. this phrase keeps coming to mind. You know, dreams are the language of God, which I've heard before. I don't know who said it, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, there's a there's a way in which it connects us to this primal, uh, nonverbal, um, imaginal space that's mm -hmm. deeply spiritual. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's everything all at once. It's time stacked on itself. It's it's the past and the future and the present. It's you know epigenetic memory. It's it's practical. It's applicable. It's actionable. It's metaphysical. It's mysterious. It's ineffable. It's everything. And I wonder how your dream work relates to your work as a musician artist. Um, yeah, thank you so much for that your curiosity. It's it's fundamental in my work. I mean, so much of even the language that I choose is referencing dreams. Um, yeah, it's my art wouldn't be what it is if it weren't for for the dream work so think it's just it's endless poetry you know it's endless imagery and it ties into this like deeper taproot of what um is coming through me that i need to know or explore or be lost in or and or for someone else to feel heard or seen or access to whatever that taproot is, you know, that really, um, you know, functions collectively. Um, 
yeah, my, my, my next album is coming out. It's been, it's been idling for a minute, which is to my chagrin and has to do with COVID. Um, but we're going to be releasing it in the next couple months. And it's an EP, it's called Ancient Powers. And the, the title and most of the tracks weave dreams into, into the work. Um, it allows me to trust the work. You know, like when I reference my dreams, I know that I'm um, bringing something that is hidden, that's coming through me into the world in a way that is um, relevant. And, and hopefully relevant for other people. Yeah, how, how has your creative life and your music mm. been instrumental in your personal development or healing? Oh, thank you for these great questions. I feel like my first album was really about grief and particularly tending to the unfinished grief in my maternal lineage. Um, yeah, I think that every body of work and whether it's music or performance um, taps into different layers of my, my healing and hopefully creates culture of permission for other people to feel inspired to do the feeling that needs to be felt. Um, there's also like a pleasure piece um, and a somatic piece of like, where am I singing from in the body? Like, how does it, how does the sound and the tone um, bring liberation? Um, there's when I was recording, I mentioned this to a, a friend who was interviewing me a while back um, about this most recent album that we recorded of one of my design constraints was like, how is this, where is the pleasure? You know, like, does this feel right? Or am I lost in the weeds of my brain trying in like production mode? Um, and if I can stay centered in that pleasure, um, that, you know, is really also like tied to dismantling the white heteronormative patriarchy. If I can tap into that felt sense in the music, I experience healing. And I hope that that is like encoded into one of the layers of the song um, or bodies of work. Um, yeah, I think I answered your question, did I? Yeah, that's beautiful. I, what a profound connection between kind of pleasure and dismantling <laughs> depressive systems. I mean, I, I, I find, you know, where my mind went first, and then I'd love to pull that thread a little bit more, um, sort of a new line of thinking for me, but the, where my mind first went when you were speaking about your art is, you know, I'm also a poet, um, as you know, and mm -hmm. when, and, and part of art for me is really just getting present to what's already alive in my imagination and my body and my and it's just it's just putting words or music or whatever your you know images to the thing that is already alive in you and it's just being awake enough present enough and attuned it's for me it's it's really a healing process to be able to trust myself enough mm. to bring what is inside of me into the three-dimensional world in a way yeah and that in itself is a healing process. Totally. And I, I've been thinking a lot about how kind of self-trust and self-love are really related in a way that mm. I haven't quite connected before because it's really hard. Like for so long, I felt so wounded because of my mental illness. Um, mm. I felt so wounded in my ability to trust my own mind and my own intuitive knowing even though it was very much intact, I didn't know which voice to listen to at times, or I felt mm -hmm. so I felt so compromised in my ability to trust my own perception, um, and and so much of my ability to reclaim love and and compassion for myself has been related to my ability to reclaim a sense of 
of my own inner knowing and a a feeling that my intuition, that I can rely on my intuition in a way that allows me to navigate the world. And there's something healing in that, that I'm not sure I I can fully articulate, Mm. but I, I feel like self-love and self-trust come together. I'm not exactly sure why um, Mm. it, it feels true to me. And the poetry is sort of like the invocation of the words coming through you is an exercise in in the self trust and the way that that threads into the self love mm-hmm. and the restoration of instinct. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love that. That feels. I feel something really similar in the act of creation and and there's also like this faith piece you know, of like just showing up and being like, all right, I'm here. Like, I don't know what is going to come through. I feel like a lot of doubt that anything is going to come through. And then it does. And there's something really, yeah. It's interesting to think about healing does dismantle systems that, you know, thrive off of our self-doubt. Yeah, because the systems can't exist if if we as individuals trust ourselves, are attuned, are com- you know to what is right and true in terms mm-hmm. of like human dignity, justice, fairness, equality. Yeah. Like when when people are fully intact, awake, connected to our inner knowing about what is right and wrong, like we can't be controlled and subjugated. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like we will not allow that, and mm-hmm. that's really you know, so much of why I, I am feeling so energized and inspired to live in a time where we have the technology to spread awareness about mm-hmm. how the relationship between personal and collective transformation, like we as individuals, when we wake up, we can together help others wake up and then together we can dismantle this whole system mm-hmm. that is oppressing all of us. Even, Mm -hmm. even the people who are in power, even the people of privilege, like we are all hurt by it, whether we know it or not, whether we're fighting tooth and nail to preserve the systems that we think are in our best interest, they are, they are destroying us. Right. Yeah, um, absolutely. And I just, I feel so privileged and inspired to live in a time where we have the resources and technology to really make a meaningful impact on global issues. And I think Mm -hmm. what feels so like eye-opening for me of late is just this awareness that it does start with our individual freedom, our individual um, Mm -hmm. emancipation uh, and a a reclaiming of our own intuition, pleasure, um, self-trust, self-love. And then as we awaken to that, we say, oh my God, you know, it's like, it's, it's a parallel process right? Um, between our own kind of self-healing and our advocacy, I think of others mm-hmm. and uh, for systemic change. Cause it's like, cause, cause it's just like, I'm not, you know, the healing isn't, oh, I'm so great. And this is why I deserve love. It's, oh, I'm a human being and every human <laughs> deserves love. Mm-hmm. And so if, if I'm going to step into my own ability to love and advocate for myself, that's not separate from, you know, love and advocacy for others. And so mm-hmm. there's just this really interesting way because I, I have such a, a history in the more individual, small micro, what's called in social work, the micro um, mm-hmm. perspective that it's been really powerful to see how uh, we can think about scaling that because what where my heart really lies is like, let's, let's end global poverty. Like let's, Mm. let's like, let's not, let's not do this anymore. Like we can change the global consciousness and all it takes is just each of us doing our own inner work and then helping others to self-liberate and, and pass it on. Yeah. I think that's where the new age movement. I mean, one of the ways, you know, that the new age movement is like deeply flawed is that it centers exclusively the self when, you know, no one's free till everyone's free. And, you know, like we are interconnected and Sophie Strand, one of my um, favorite contemporary thinkers talks about how the myth of the hero's journey is, it needs to end. And we, and what needs to emerge is a mycological consciousness, which is like the, you know, the networking 
the power of the network is um, it's the way forward. And so it is like this ellipsis where it's like finding that um, harmony between, you know, restoring the um, degraded ecology of the self um, that is degraded from the empire, from imperialism. Currently, you know, what that looks like is the white heteronormative patriarchy and mono, in my opinion, the monotheistic influence. It's like in the mix, certainly. Um, and then also exploring like, what does your heart feel called to outside of yourself where you see the degrade, degradation and the, um, the, the destruction of the other's dignity, whether it's, you know, poverty, um, whether it's like super fund sites, um, you know, the list goes on and on with the human and the non-human. And we each have our particular genius that we can lend to what we feel called to help in the regeneration and restoration of. And they can't, they have to coexist in parallel. Individual and societal change are inextricably interwoven. They're yeah. counterparts. You know, again, we have this way of parsing and separating dichotomizing but really like as individuals we are incomplete if we do not you know if we if we are not in some way in service of the collective um, mm -hmm. if we like our destiny is in some ways to self-liberate so that we can you know offer that gift to others not just as you say with the new age movement you know this there's something so incomplete mm -hmm. and and um I almost want to say masturbatory mm -hmm. about, about that approach to self-development. Like it's all about me just living my best life. Like that's mm -hmm. like, I'm the, like there, that's an incomplete life. That's not about your best life is not lived simply for you. Part of you mm -hmm. living your best life is you figuring out your unique gift and how you can offer it in service. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there's just, yeah, I, I totally agree. I have a lot of problems with the new age movement. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not, not the least. <laughs> no, that's just one of the, the deep design flaws. Yeah, well, that's, that's kind of, I think, another reason why I'm feeling, you know, excited to create content because there's such a spiritual hunger right now. There's a hunger for meaning and purpose and, and spiritual consciousness, but there's not a language around spirituality that isn't new agey and that isn't dogmatic or religious. And so mm -hmm. I've been really kind of, you know, that has been a very healing and empowering part of my journey is was starting to listen to thinkers who were having conversations around spirituality where I didn't have any alarm bells, where I didn't like feel that protective, like, oh, this doesn't feel right to me. Like mm -hmm. it's either culty or it's narcissistic or it's new agey or it's dog, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. It was like, like any time I was, interfacing with people around spirituality, one of those things would come up in such a way that I didn't feel safe engaging deeply. And it's like mm -hmm. spirituality is such a deep, steep process that like it requires a lot of safety and tenderness. And so, mm -hmm. um, you know, really wanting to normalize spirituality and kind of offer a, a framework for how we access you know, our birthright, which is our connection to nature, to our, our oneness. Um, mm -hmm. And, and we, we are most alive when in a way we are least um, self-focused, right? Mm -hmm. There is some coming together that needs to happen between some sweet spot between how we identify as individual beings and function in the greater whole. And um, the systems that are really thriving right now don't want that. And they want us existing in a binary. They want us existing in either or. They want us to exist in results instead of the meandering process, which is the truth of what it means to be and the mystery of this dimension and planet. Um, yeah. It's an interesting time. And like with climate change and like all of the just like documentation of outrageous oppression that is happening, it's really, how do we, how do we 
facilitate change, like very real change and acknowledge that like we're a part of a process, we're a part of a lineage that like, it's not going to all happen in our lifetime. There's just like way too much work to do. So what does it mean for us to do our part and keep, it's almost like seed saving, you know, it's like, what is our refinement that we have to offer to give to the ones coming in after us? Yeah, you know? and, and my belief is that if we can take, you know, when we take as much ownership and responsibility for our own internalized oppression, pain, suffering, shadow, um, that as we transmute that and heal that, that organically and naturally, we begin mm -hmm. to wake up to how we, we can uniquely serve the collective. So I think that, yeah. you know, that it's so important because I've struggled with for such a long time, this like, how do I help the world? How do I help the world? And, you know, I think it's like, well, you, you, you really have to do a significant amount and not always. I mean, of course you're always helping the world at every stage in your journey, but I think there's, I guess I just want to give people permission to be mm -hmm. where they're at in their process that like, if right in this moment, you are focusing on your own healing, trust that in the long run, that will be in service. That's mm -hmm. not being selfish. You know? Right. Right. Um, That's a really important distinction. Yeah. And like, people like we all are in various ways just going through a hell of a time it's so hard and it's so it's so overwhelming all of the inputs that are coming at us that need tending and I totally appreciate you speaking to that that's um because the exceptionalism is another way that we oppress ourselves you know so yeah, thank you for speaking to that. That feels really important. It's, it's really a compassion piece. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And a surrender piece. It's like, you know, for me, I am constantly kind of struggling between the aspirational and the actual. Mm. And, you know, that aspirational, when I'm in right relationship to my aspirations, they fuel me. But when I'm in, um, wrong relationship they sh they just create shame and actually mm. um, drive me away from you know my ability to birth what is what is true for me yeah and that it's okay to be where you're at and thank you so much any final words you'd like to share thank you and i just want to send love to everyone tuning in. Thank you so much for, for being here and um, mm -hmm. sharing your, your gifts and your perspectives. Thank you. It's fun to chat. Take care.